وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده رسول بعد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله It is good to be back again after the kind of a long break, Ramadan, and then after Ramadan to do another <coughs> cause, which is actually another journey of knowledge, insha'Allah, hoping that we'll benefit something from it. Now, before we start, just a small reminder about the class itself or how we're going to run it. Number one, if you're not going to come every day or consistently, you don't have to show up every day if you have other commitments. Like some of you have reason that concern that I can only come Wednesday, I can only come Thursday. That is fine. That is completely fine. If you cannot come except one day, that is okay. That is completely okay. You can follow up with what you missed through the recordings. But if you're not planning to come, please don't take the the binder. Just leave it for someone who's going to benefit from it. Leave it for someone who's going to benefit. Number two, about the binder itself. How we're going to do this one. This class will be different from the previous ones. As we go, for every class, maybe for every other class, we'll be having the printouts, which will be handed and you will be putting them in your binder. I'll be handing out the printouts as we go through every class when it's needed. We're beginning with this, which is around, I think, eight pages or 10 pages. This is for today and tomorrow maybe. Next class or next week, we'll have be having uh, other printouts. So everyone gets a copy. You put it in your, in your binder and we go as we go. So that also comes down to the point of at least doing the registration. Registration is important so that we know how many people are here. See, like now, we don't have enough binders because almost all of us did not register. Did anyone do the registration before we came? One, two. Anyone this side? No one. So we don't have an idea of how many things we have to print. and So it's always good for all of us. So the sister has the forms and the brother here will have the forms. Please register. If you have any concerns, any um, problems in paying, you don't have to, like we always say. If you cannot pay, that should not be a reason for you not to come. If you can pay, Next month, that is okay. Just put it there or speak to us and so that we know. Your email, please write it very clearly. You have that problem always. Write your email very clearly. That's the main way of communication between me and you or between us, the Masjid the Abu Huraira Institute and you. Put your email very clearly, please. Print it. Other than that, I'm excited. Although I don't look like I'm excited, I don't speak like I'm excited. But I'm warming up after the long break. Who's excited? Okay, that's good. This side? Okay, not so good. <laughs> they have enough forms here. Brothers, who does not have the form? Today we're starting this time, tomorrow we're starting this time, 7 o'clock sharp. But next week, it's going to be 7. Next week, what time is Maghrib? Who has a phone? Can you please just check quickly? Next one is the what time will be Maghrib? Today is 7.23. Seven twelve. So next week we start after Maghrib. Because we cannot come and have class for 12 minutes and then break. 
So it's better next week, not tomorrow. Next Wednesday we start after Maghrib. We will finish exactly at 9 o'clock. Exactly 9 o'clock we finish. If you don't have the binder, please share with someone. You'll have to share for today, then tomorrow we'll bring more, inshallah. You're ready now? Yeah, I can start. Yes. <coughs> you're late. You're late, you don't get a book. Alaikum salam, you're late also. Okay. I said all the while conference volunteers come for free. <laughs> Did I say that actually? I said if you cannot afford it. If you want to quote me, you have to quote me exactly the way I said it. If you cannot afford it, then it's on me. I said that. So you just put my name there. Who's right? The sheikh is going to pay. I'm serious. Anyone who cannot pay, just write the sheikh is going to pay. That is open for the all volunteers, all conference volunteers. So even those who could afford it, they only pay half. Those who cannot afford it, it's on me. So you write who, his name or my name. Okay, basic rules of class. I think all of us know them. Proper Islamic dressing. Brothers, no sleeveless, no shorts. Sisters, proper hijab. Allies, you don't come to my class. Number two, respect yourself, you'll be respected. Number three, don't laugh when someone asks a question. Don't laugh when anyone asks a question which you think is funny. Don't laugh. Number four, time is money. Time, not money in the actual sense, but time is very important. See, like right now we cannot start anymore because... It's four minutes to Maghrib.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بعد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله This is the first sitting إن شاء الله where we'll be discussing the عقيدة the belief or the creed of the four imams Abu Hanifa Malik, Shafi'i, and Ahmad. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Inshallah, as decided, we'll be doing it two days a week for around two hours maximum. And that is enough. Aqeedah is the most important thing you'll ever learn. Islam is beliefs and actions. Islam is not just rites of worship which you do practical and that's it. Islam is beliefs just like any other ideology or any other dogma or any other religion. It's the belief in fact which makes you different from those who are not Muslims. Aqeedah, the word Aqeedah in Arabic comes from the root word Uqda. Who knows what a uqda is? A knot. When you take a rope or a string and you tie a knot. That's where this word comes from. It's called aqidah because it should be something which is bounded to your, to your heart. It should be like a knot on your heart. It's the things which are about the belief. That is why it's called aqidah. What do you hold as your beliefs? We will be discussing the beliefs of Islam. The beliefs which Malik, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, and Ahmad held. And those who are after them and those who are before them. What did they believe? In short, we'll be discussing the beliefs of what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to teach. The correct beliefs. That's what we want to learn. And we will find, inshallah, as we go through this journey of learning, that all these imams and those who came after them and those who came before them, they all held more or less the same beliefs. Most of us, when you hear the aqidah of the four imams, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmad, you get the idea of the madhabs already. Four different groups. What is a madhab? Who knows? What is a madhab? A school of thought. Easier English? Someone said it. No, someone said it. Opinion. It's an opinion. There's an issue which is here which is brought to the imam or the sheikh or the maulana or the al whoever he is, whatever title you give him, it is brought to the scholar. And he looks at it, and according to the knowledge he has, he says, my opinion is that it is halal. The other one says, my opinion, I think it's recommended, you should do it. The other one says, my opinion is haram. The opinion, that's the madhab. That's the madhab. Madhab is from two words. It means ma dhahaba ilayh. They just shortened it. What Shafi'i took as his opinion in this matter. What Ahmad took as his opinion. The madhab is the opinions of the particular imam in an issue. But then people who came after them, they took all these issues and they formulated principles of how the imam reached to these opinions. Then the madhabs as a group grew. Okay? So when you hear madhab of Shafi'i, madhab of Malik, madhab of Ahmad, is he talking about aqidah as we are talking about today? Or is talking about what? He's talking about the fiqh issues, what we call the rulings, jurisprudence, the ahkam. The ahkam. They never had four different madhabs in aqidah. 
beliefs. And that's what we are going to learn, inshallah, with proofs. That is one thing we have to know. And that is what we're trying to say and preach. The madhabs are madhabs in fiqh, ahkam, rulings, jurisprudence. One of them might say, if you touch a woman and you have wudu, you have to redo your wudu. Another one might say, no. If she's your wife, your sister, your daughter, you don't have to do wudu. That's an opinion, and that's another opinion. One might say, when you pray, you read the basmala, the bismillah. You read it out loud. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah, everything should be out loud. Others might say, no, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim should be silent. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen should be out loud. Another one might say, in an issue maybe like touching the Quran. Say a woman, if she is unclean, she cannot touch the Quran. Meaning if she's in her days, her period. Another might say, no, there's nothing stopping her from that. These are some small examples. That is the place they had the madhabs, different opinions. But in aqeedah, beliefs, they didn't have opinions, except for one or two small issues. Do we understand? Why would they differ in the first place before moving on? Why would they differ? Why would someone say, this is okay, this is not okay? The other one says, this is not okay. None. Depending on the knowledge he had. Depending on the knowledge he had. This is one thing we have to learn. Muslims, we have to know. There is no one who knows everything. There is no one who knows everything. The only person who knew everything of this religion was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two. There is no one who is infallible, who does not make mistakes, except the Prophet wasallam. And those of you who are with us when we are doing Kitab al-Iman of Sahih al-Bukhari, who went through the hadith of where Abu Bakr and Umar and the rest were there, and the Prophet wasallam, he saw a dream. Then he asked them, who is going to interpret this dream? And Abu Bakr said, I will try. And Abu Bakr interpreted that dream. The Prophet Sam then said what? Some of it you got right, and some of it you got wrong. There is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, the greatest man after all prophets. Our Prophet وسلم, says to him, some of it was right, some of it was wrong. If Abu Bakr could make a mistake, me and you will have to believe with no doubt that Malik can make a mistake. Shafi'i can make a mistake, Abu Hanifa can make a mistake, Ahmad can make a mistake, you can make mistake, I can make mistakes. Our aqeedah, our belief as Muslims who follow the proper way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there is no one who is ma'asoom, infallible except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So some knowledge can be hidden from someone. So, simply saying, I know this hadith, but he does not know about this hadith. And then the same question is posed to me and to him. Will our answers be same? Obviously, they'll be different. That's one of the main reasons why the imams, they differed in some of those issues. And you know, during their time, you had to travel distances to get hadith. You had to travel distances. We, everything has become easy for us. In one small gadget, you have all the books of hadith you need. All the books of fiqh you need. That is one of the main reasons why they differed. Okay? You have to understand that. So, the aqeedah of the four imams, this is the belief. We're not talking about the madhab issues, which are the fiqh issues. Let me ask you something. 
What is Islam? Submission to Allah. Okay. Any other answer? A way of life which is leading back to Allah. Okay. Any other answer? It's a belief. Okay, repeat so I can translate. Submitting to Allah by Tawheed and submitting to Him by obey obeying Him and making Him one or making Him one in just worship, worshiping Him alone, basically. Any other answers? What is Islam, this deen which you have chosen? No, I'm speaking like, imagine Robert is, or Mike is speaking to you. And he says, what is Islam? What would you say? Compliance of your will with the will of Allah. Submission. Submission, like they said, submitting to Allah. That is true. You have another answer? Yes, yeah, a religion, a way of life. But what is Islam? What does it mean? What does being Muslim mean? Submit. Okay, I think we agree on all of, on all of us, we agree on that. Submitting to Allah. Let's keep it short and simple. Submitting to Allah. What does that mean? How do you submit to Allah? It means following the commands of Allah and His Prophet. Okay. Another answer? Having the three levels of Iman. Submission of the heart, testament of the tongue, and action of the limbs. Okay. Yeah, but how do you do that? My question is, how do you do that? By following the Quran and the Sunnah. Making Allah and His Messenger the judge in all matters of your life without any resistance. resistance. Submitting to Allah. You just made it clear, but how do you do that? Practically, if I say, okay, I became Muslim, how do I submit myself to Allah? Worshipping Allah alone. How do I do that? Following the Quran and the Sunnah. Learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. How do I do that? <laughs> you follow the Quran and the Sunnah. All of you are correct. You follow? Because you say you have, you're submitting yourself to your God, Allah. But how do you know now I'm submitting and now I'm, resist, I'm resisting? There has to be a set of commands and laws which he brought. And he said, okay, this is how you follow. And this is how you don't follow. Where are those commands and sets of laws? It's in the Quran, the book of Allah, and the messenger he sent, Muhammad sallallahu He came with the way of how to submit to Allah. So now if I come and say to you, you can actually go and eat pork. Tomorrow go to Tim Hortons in morning breakfast and get yourself a bacon, double bacon, double cheese sandwich. What would you say to me? Other than saying I'm crazy. You'll say? You say it's haram. It's not allowed Islamically. How do you know it's not allowed? Because it's written in the Quran that your Lord who you want to submit to, he says to you, stay away from pork. If I come tomorrow and I say to you, sisters, you don't have to wear the abaya and the, and the khimar. You can actually go out in tight jeans and mini skirts. What would you say to me apart from I'm crazy? What is my proof? When actually I'm contradicting the, the Quran and the Sunnah. The point I'm trying to make is what? Islam is you submitting to the commands of Allah 
as in his book and as brought by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We'll take a short break and then come back. He's asking why. For those of you who don't know, because this recording goes to the TV also. So we have to take breaks after every 12 minutes. So when I say we're taking a short break, it's not for you. It's for the camera. Okay? After every 12 or 13 minutes, that's going to happen. No There's no break. There's no break. You can drink in this class. You cannot eat in this class. You know, bring your water, your juice, your tea. It's okay. But you cannot eat in this class. If you have any questions, I, s I prefer you write them down. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We were discussing before the break that Islam is submission. Submission to your creator. How do you submit? You follow the set of laws and commands which he brought us in the Quran and in the Sunnah of his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, it is strange though. You find Muslims contradicting that simple principle which, which is Islam. That they make their lifestyle or their rights of worship in fact or even greater than that, their beliefs, their aqidah contrary to what the Quran and the Sunnah says. Or less than that, they do things which the Quran and the Sunnah never spoke of. And they hold those things as their beliefs or they practice them or as their lifestyle in general. If we agree here that Islam is submission to Allah by following the Quran and the Sunnah, it is very important also to know that the four Imams who we're speaking about, they said the same thing and they had the same message. And they actually emphasized this so much. They emphasized this concept, this concept of submission. They emphasize it so much. We have two handouts today. One which is four pages, it says Usul Sunnah, Foundation of the Sunnah in the beginning. Just leave that, page one to four, just put on the side, put on the side. Then you have the next handout, it also starts from page one. It says, sayings of the Imams regarding following the Sunnah and ignoring the views contradictory to it. Let's look at that. One way of you knowing someone is speaking the truth or not is that everything he speaks will be proven. MashaAllah, very good. Or at least referenced. Then you go and double check. Maybe he's lying in his references or not. When you see someone who just speaks with no references, with no proofs, then you know there's a problem. Someone who gives you a khutbah or a talk, 45 minutes, half an hour, one hour, and he only mentions one verse of the Quran. There's a problem. Unless you're speaking about business or hiking or whatever, then okay. But if you're speaking about the religion and in one hour you only mention one verse, there's a problem. Now everything we're going to mention here is referenced. You'll see, in fact, the footnotes are more than the actual text. The footnotes are more than the actual text. I wouldn't be reading, I would not be reading most of the footnotes. That's for you. That's why everyone has a binder. My job as a teacher is to help you understand the parts which are a bit hard. You have a more important job of going home and reviewing and reading again so that you become good in what you're studying. It says, Allah the mighty and sublime, he says, I'll be reading, then when we need explanation, I'll be explaining. Allah the mighty and sublime, he says, اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه أولياء قليلا ما تذكرون Follow, O oh man, O oh human beings, follow. This is a command 
command from Allah. You just said Islam is submission, submission to the Quran and the Sunnah, right or wrong? So if I bring you one verse of the Quran, is that enough or not? If I say today, like you are saying to me, pork is haram, bacon is haram. How many verses do I have to prove that with, or you have to prove that with? One is enough. Good. We agree to that, all of us? Yes. One is enough. Yes. It has to be taken in context, yes. No, things which are very clear like this, when Allah says, stay away from pork, it is clear. One is enough. So this verse, your Lord and my Lord, he says, follow all human beings. The revelation given to you from your Lord. And follow not as friends and protectors other than him. Little is it that you remember of admonition. Follow the revelation which has come from who? Your Lord. And don't take other small gods who tell you something contradictory to that revelation and you follow it. When you do that, you are doing what? You are actually taking those people as other gods. And follow not as friends and protectors other than him. This verse it just emphasizes the importance of sticking to the revelation, the Quran and the Sunnah. It says, Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah. Abu Hanifa, I know most of you are expecting biographies, maybe. I'll talk about Abu Hanifa and then Shafi'i and then uh, and then Malik and I'll do it at the end of this cause see how many of you show up and become patient let's see how patient you are the last day we'll be discussing their biographies huh? after the exam last last day last minutes in fact Abu Hanifa he said the first of them, now this is actually taken from the introduction of the book which we did here, The Prophet's Prayer Described by Sheikh al -Alban. He has this introduction in his book. If you want more details, you go back to the book and read. He says the first of them is Abu Hanifa Nu'man ibn Thabit. That's his full name, Nu'man ibn Thabit. Whose companions have narrated from him various sayings and diverse warnings. All of them leading to one thing, the obligation to accept the hadith and to give up the opinions of the Imams which contradict it. The obligation of accepting the Hadith and giving up the opinions of the Imams which contradict it. Abu Hanifa said, number one, when a Hadith is found to be Sahih, meaning authentic, then that is my madhab, that is my way. That is my opinion. And that is something we have agreed on, right? We agreed on before starting, right or wrong? We said Islam is submission, submission to what? The Quran and the Sunnah, the authentic hadith. So that is our opinions, right? That is what he says. When the hadith is found to be sahih, then that is my madhab. In the footnote, it says this was narrated or quoted by Ibn Abidin in al Hashia. It's one of the major books of Hanafi fiqh. And in the essay, Rasmul Mufti, from the compilation of Ibn, Ibn Abidin, and Sheikh Salih al Fulan in Iqad al Himam. Ibn Abidin, he quoted from Sharh al Hidayah by Ibn al Shahna al Kabir, the teacher of Ibn al Hummam. Ibn al Hummam is one of the major scholars of Hanafi fiqh. Okay? Ibn al Hummam. He wrote the book Fath al Qadir. And he wrote it when he was, in a, he was in prison. You know, back in the days, there are two types of prisons. The prison, you know, like today, or they would put someone in a well. The well which you dig, they would put someone in a well. There's no way to, to come out. Ibn al Humam, he wrote his book while well in the well. This is one of the greatest books in Hanafi Madhab. One of the greatest books, Fath al Qadir. Listen to what he says. He says, when a hadith contrary to the madhab is found to be sahih, 
one should act on the hadith and make that his madhab. Beautiful words. Acting on the hadith will not invalidate the followers being a Hanafi. For it is authentically reported that Abu Hanifa said, when a hadith is found to be sahih, then that is my madhab. It says in the next paragraph, this is a part this is part of the completeness of the knowledge and piety of the Imams. For they indicated by saying this that they were not vast in the whole of the Sunnah. They're just saying that I don't know everything. So when you come by a hadith and you find it is sahih, then know that I, I'm following that, even if I didn't say that. It would happen, Imam Shafi'i has elucidated this thoroughly, you'll see later. It would happen that they would contradict a sunnah because they were unaware of it. We said everyone makes mistakes. So they commanded us to stick to the sunnah and regard it as part of their madhab. May Allah show his mercy on all of them. Amen. Number two, he said, It is not permitted for anyone to accept our views if they did not know from where we got them from. Abu Hanifa says, It is not allowed for you to follow me if you don't know where I took whatever I'm saying. If it comes from the Quran and the Sunnah, then take it. If it's something you don't know where I came up from, like you guys when I asked you, if I say today it's okay to go and get your double bacon sandwich at Timmy's tomorrow morning, you said, no, you're wrong. Why? Because I'm contradicting the Quran and the Sunnah. Likewise, he's saying the same thing. I have to bring proof for that, and there's no proof for that. He says, if I bring you words and statements which have no proof, don't just follow me just because I said it. No. You understand? Number three. In one narration, it say, he says, it is prohibited for someone who does not know my evidence to give verdicts fatwa on the basis of my words. It is prohibited. He says it is haram for someone who does not know my evidence to give the fatwa just by following me. Just because Abu Hanifa said and they said the same thing, he says it is haram for you. Unless you know why I said that. He's warning against what? Who knows? Huh? Blind following. He's warning against blind following. Another narration adds, for we are mortals. We are human beings. We say one, something one day and take it back the next day. We are bound to make mistakes. Another narration he said, woe to you. Woe to you, O Ya'qub. Who's Ya'qub? Don't tell me the prophet. His student. The Hanafi Madhab is made up of three main figures or characters. Abu Hanifa himself, and who? Ya'qub, and Abu Yusuf, Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani. Are you sure? Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani. Three people. These are the pillars of the Hanafi Madhab. These two used to be friends of Abu Hanifa. They, used, they lived in the same time. They used to be his students. So he says to him here, What to you, O Yaqub? Do not write down everything you hear from me. For it happens that I hold one opinion today and reject it tomorrow. And or hold one opinion tomorrow and reject it the day after tomorrow. Why? It says here in the footnote, which I just summarized. This was because the Imam would often base his views on Qiyas, analogy. Imam Abu Hanifa, he used a lot of Qiyas, analogy. Because he didn't get so many hadith. There's a lot of analogy, Qiyas, in the Hanafi Madhab. That's why it's easy for him to change his opinion. For tomorrow if he gets the hadith, now he has to change his opinion. Or a hadith of the Prophet would reach him. So he would accept that and ignore his previous views. That footnote is very important. You read it on yourself, by yourself, sorry. 
You read it by yourself. That footnote is very important. Foot number three. We'll take another small break and then come back, inshallah. You get used to it. You have any questions? One quick question, very quick. We know that Imam Shafi'i changed his madhab, his opinions when he traveled. Yeah, we have the Qadim and the Jadid. The opinions he had in Baghdad and in Mecca when he was a young boy and when he went to Misr. When he went to Misr, he changed a lot of his opinions, Imam Shafi'i. So that it's, we, it's known in the Shafi'i Madhab, we have Al-Madhab Al-Qadim and Madhab Jadid, the new Madhab and the old Madhab. That's how much he used to change. Abu Hanifa, we have uh, examples, we have examples. In fact, we have examples in Aqeedah. We'll mention those, inshallah. Another quick question? Yes. What is this stuff? No, no. Come take a look at it. Just bring me some water, please. Yes, Akhi. One belief, one way. That's not allowed. Look at it. Huh? But there is different. No, 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 yes. The aqeedah is only one of the four imams, and that's what we are learning, yes. <laughs> but again, we are human beings. You could make a mistake. Or like we say, maybe those hadith never reached them. So if a hadith never reached you, how can you believe in that? And you don't know it. Right? No. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome back after that small break. Number three, he says, Imam Abu Hanifa, that's the next page, page three. When I say something contradicting the book of Allah, the exalted, or what is narrated from the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then ignore my saying. When I say something contradicting the book of Allah, when I say to you, pork is halal, or it is halal for the woman to go out, or it is okay for the woman to go out without being properly covered. Or what is narrated from the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi What do you do? Then ignore my saying. This is who saying these words? Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah. Why do we start with Abu Hanifa? He was the eldest of them. Abu Hanifa was born earlier than Malik and Shafi and Ahmad. The way we put it is the way they came in order of life also. Abu Hanifa and then Malik and then Shafi'i and then Ahmad. Ahmad was the youngest of all. Abu Hanifa was the oldest of all or the eldest of all. Okay. Now that is Imam Abu Hanifa and we have another footnote which is very important. You go read that footnote also. That is your homework. Your homework today is what? Footnote number three and footnote number four. Number two, now coming to Imam Malik ibn Anas, rahimahullah. He says, number one, truly I'm only a mortal. I make mistakes sometimes and I'm correct sometimes. Therefore, look into my opinions. All that agrees with the book and the sunnah, accept it. If I was you, I would underline accept it. And all that does not agree with the book and the sunnah, I would underline that. It says, ignore it. It says I'm only human. I make mistakes sometimes also. And I'm correct sometimes. Whatever I say which is according and is according to the Quran and the Sunnah, take it. Whatever I say which is contradictory to that, ignore it. This is who? Imam Malik. Isn't it similar to what Imam Abu Hanifa said? 
It's as if it's copy paste. They didn't have copy paste during that time, of course, right? But it's as if it's the same. And there's no proof that they ever met. They never met. Imam Malik never met Imam Abu Hanifa. Never. But this is the deen they learned. This is the aqidah they took from those before them. Whatever agrees to the Quran and the Sunnah, that is the religion. Follow, O oh man, what has been revealed to you from your Lord. Whatever contradicts that, ignore it. Number two, he says, everyone after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will have his sayings accepted and rejected. Everyone. There's only one ma'asum, infallible person in this ummah that was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Never forget, the Prophet said to Abu Bakr, what? Some of it was right and some of it was wrong. Number three, Ibn Wahb was one of the students of Imam Malik. He said, I heard Malik being asked, now this is a practical example, look at the practical example. He says, I heard Malik being asked about cleaning between the toes during ablution, during wudu. When you're making wudu, should you clean between the toes? And he said, the people do not have to do that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to wash between your toes. Ibn Wahab says, I did not approach him until the crowd had lessened. People had gone away. This is from the manners of giving each other advice. When you see your brother making a mistake, you don't just jump on him. There's manners of advising each other. Just like you would not like to be humiliated in front of everyone, don't do it to others. Ibn Wahab said, I left, I, 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 I stopped until everyone had, the crowd had lessened. Then I said to him, we know of a sunnah about that. He said, what is it? I said, Layth ibn Sa'ad, ibn Lahia, and Amr ibn Harith, they narrated to us from Yazid ibn Amr al-Ma'afiri, from Abdurrahman al-Hubuli, from Mustawrid ibn Shaddad al-Qurayshi, who said, I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rubbing between his toes with his little finger. The one you call the pinky. Look how beautiful this is. He did not say, you know what, I think you should do it. He said, no, no. He knows that this deen is what? The Quran and the Sun. So right away he says, no, I know of a Sunnah which says that. And he brings him the chain of narration. Laith bin Sa'ad and Ibn Lahia and Ibn Amr bin Harith narrated from us from Yazid bin Amr, from Abu Abdurrahman, from Mustar bin Shaddad, who said, I saw the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi doing that with his small finger. Malik then said, this hadith is sound, but it is good. It's a good hadith. I had not heard of it until now. If Mam Malik had some things he did not know, me and you. But look, he says, afterwards, I heard him being asked about the same thing on which he ordered cleaning between the toes. It said the people, you have to do it. This is practical submission. This is practical Islam. Now this is submission. It comes, it is there, it is in the sunnah. You say, okay, if it's there then, this is what the imams preached. This is what they practiced. This is what Muslims, us, we need today. It's proven, it's in the Quran, it's in the sunnah. Leave your statement, leave your opinion. Leave the opinion of your father and your grandfather. Leave the opinion of your sheikh and your imam and your madhab. Follow, O oh human beings, what has been revealed to you from your Lord. And do not take as partners and protect as others besides him. It's clear? Okay, we move on to Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah. He says, as for Imam Shafi'i, the quotations from him are most numerous and beautiful. And his followers were the best in sticking to them. 
Number one, Imam Shafi'i said, the sunnahs of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, reach as well as escape from every one of us. We get some knowledge, we don't have some knowledge. So whenever I voice my opinion or formulate a principle where something contrary to my view exists on the authority of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, then the correct view is what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has said. And it is my view in fact. It's beautiful. He says if I formulate principles or I give opinions, then you find that the sunnah is contrary to that. Leave my opinion and follow the sunnah. In fact, that is now my opinion. Number two, he says, the Muslims are unanimously agreed that if a sunnah of the messenger of Allah وسلم, is made clear to someone, it is not permitted. It is not permitted for him to leave it for the saying of anyone else. This is something the Muslims of that time, they agreed on. All the Muslims. Number three, he says, If you find in my writings something different to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, then speak on the basis of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and leave what I have said. Another narration says, then follow the sunnah and do not look sideways at anyone else's saying. Some of us, we have this problem. You love to go in the crowd. Everyone is doing it, so it must be good. Everyone has an iPhone, it must be good. Everyone wears their shoes like this, so no, no. This is right, it is right. Don't look sideways. Don't look sideways. Don't worry about people. You are a Muslim. What does a Muslim do? He submits. He submits to who? I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. To Allah and? It's simple. But try doing it practical and see. He says, when a hadith is found to be sahih, that is my madhab. Didn't we go through those words already? Who said those words? Abu Hanifa said that. Shafi'i never met Abu Hanifa. They never met. But they're saying the same words. Why? Because this is the Islam they understood. This is Islam, simply. Number five, Imam Shafi'i met with Imam Ahmad. Ahmad was younger, but he met with him. He addressed Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal saying, you are more knowledgeable about the hadith than I. Look at the humility and the humbleness they had. Shafi was more older. Shafi is well known. He's a great imam. But he's saying to Ahmad, you are more knowledgeable of the hadith than I. One scholar could be more, could be stronger in one field than the other. Imam Ahmad was strongest of all of them in hadith. No doubt about that. Shafi'i says to Ahmad who's younger than him, you are more knowledgeable about hadith than I. So when a hadith is sahih, inform me of it. Whether it is from Kufa, where is Kufa? Huh? Iraq. Basra, Iraq, Syria, it's Syria. May Allah give the people of Syria respite. May Allah give them victory which is close. So that I may take the view of the hadith. As long as it is sahih, he says to him. When you find a hadith, O oh Ahmad, inform me of it. So I can take that hadith and make it my view. And as long as it is sahih, not just any hadith. Not just any hadith, because you know there's the sahih and the da'if, there's the authentic and the weak. Some people love the weak hadith. They just love the weak hadith, because it goes with their desires. He says no. And you know the story of Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad? No? Okay, after the break, inshallah.
Quick question. How many people don't get the book? Can you count? Are you coming tomorrow? So inshallah. This side? Just one, two, three, four, five, six, six. And this side? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Number six, it says, or oh, number seven, number seven is beautiful, it says to finish off. Every statement on the authority of the Prophet sallallahu is also my view. Even if you did not hear it from me. And that is what all of us say. Every statement of the Prophet sallallahu that is my view. Even if you never heard me saying that. Imam Ahmad now. Imam Ahmad was the foremost among the Imams in collecting the Sunnah and sticking to it. So much that he even disliked that a book consisting of deductions and opinions be written. Because of this he said, Do not follow my opinion. Neither follow the opinion of Malik, nor Shafi'i, nor Awza'i, nor Thawri. But take from where they took. What did they take? The Quran and the Sunnah. And you see those two names, maybe they are foreign to some of us. Al-Awza'i and Imam Sufyan al-Thawri. You have to know something, brothers and sisters. There was thousands of Imams who were greater than Malik Shafi Abu Hanifa Malik, Ahmad. Greater than them, I'm saying this. Before them and maybe after them. Before them, there was the Sahaba. A billion Abu Hanifas cannot be the same as one Abu Bakr. And a billion Shafi'is cannot be the same as one Umar. And a billion Maliks cannot be the same as one Uthman or one Ali or one Aisha. And like that. That is our belief. Because Allah and the Prophet said, no one can be the same as the Sahaba. And no one can be more knowledgeable of the deen than the Sahaba. Especially the great Sahaba. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Aisha, Fatima, Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas, Zaid, the two Zaids, Mu'adh bin Jabal, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas. No one can come close to those people. No, no one. You have to understand that. These Imams, yes, they are great Imams. We respect them. We follow them. But there was people before them. This is what they're telling you. And also during that time, there was other Imams also. Al-Awza'i was before them. Awza'i is one of the greatest Imams. Sufyan al-Thawri is one of the greatest Imams. Imam, Ma Imam Ahmad is saying here though, don't follow my opinion. Or Malik, or Shafi'i, or Awza'i, or Thawri. But take from where they took. They took from the Quran and the Sunnah. He says in one narration, do not copy your deen from any one of these. But whatever comes from the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, take it. Then, next are their successors. The successors of the companions, who we call whom? Tabi'in. The generation which came after the companions. The companions are those who lived and saw the Prophet ﷺ. And they took the deen from him. Then came the generation who did not see the Prophet Sallallahu but they saw the companions. So they learned from Abu Bakr, Umar, Abu Huraira, Aisha. That is the second best generation. Those ones are better than Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmad. Then after them are the successors of the successors. This is where Abu Hanifa and Malik are at. He says, after that, you have a choice. 
Number two, he says, the opinion of Awza'i, opinion of Malik, opinion of Abu Hanifa, all of it is opinion, and it is equal in my eyes. However, the proof is in the narrations from the Prophet ﷺ. And lastly, he says, whoever rejects a statement of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is on the brink of destruction. The rest of it you'll read by yourself. Now someone please summarize all of this for me. In three sentences. Yalla. It's one sentence. It's beautiful. All the imams they say. Follow the same thing. Atiyu Allah, atiyu Rasul, obey Allah and obey His Messenger. Yes. If there's a Sahih Hadith authentic, then that is their madhab. One beautiful statement, sentence, sorry. Did you put a period at the end? Yes, I suppose. Yes, Yahya. That is one long, one beautiful long sentence. Because there was and and whatever. So that's one sentence, right? You cannot start a sentence with and. You know that guys who are still in high school, don't make that mistake. Or university, you write it when you're writing, or whatever you're writing. Don't put a period then start with and. It doesn't work like that. He said, although the imams differed in fiqh issues, the Aqidah was one. Someone else, this side, summarize what we have been speaking about. Take the Quran and the Sunnah above everything. Another one? You had your three sentences, you just used one. You want a second one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is not permitted, permitted for, for anybody to take uh, a, a hadith which is going to not end because who are, they don't know where they start from. Like here, there's no there's no occasion. You have one more sentence. Um, you don't understand? I don't want to use that. You don't want to use that one. <laughs> I think it is clear though. Is it clear guys? Okay. This is a small introduction you had to go through. You had to go through. So that you understand that they preach the same thing. Now today when we are praying, we'll see it practically inshallah. When we say, please join your feet and don't leave any gaps. What are you going to say to me? It is sahih and we follow it. Okay. I'll be watching. Or will you say to me, no, my madhab says no. <coughs> my madhab says I should leave a gap of four fingers. Just one small example. I'm not putting anyone on the spot. I'm just saying. Will you be like Imam Malik? Yeah, Imam, do you know anything of people wiping between their toes? He says, no, I don't know. Don't, we don't have to do that. Then Ibn Wahab gives, gives him the hadith, and he does it right away. This is what we need. Okay. Now, we go to the other handout. It says, as you see, well, mine has some writing. Don't look at that. It says, Usul al-Sunnah, foundations of the Sunnah, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal al-Shaybani, of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal al-Shaybani. It says that, 
That is the original book. This book will be doing is the small book which is called Usul Sunnah, the foundations of the Sunnah, which was written or narrated by Imam Ahmad from Imam Ahmad. The book which we were going to do, the other one, it just has the Aqid of Imam Ahmad, uh, sorry, Abu Hanifa, then Malik, then Shafi, then Ahmad. It has been very difficult to join everything. So now we're taking this book and in the footnotes we're putting the statements of the other Imams. That way we still prove that this is the same Aqidah for all of them. And as you saw already, we can actually say this course has ended. All of you have learned the Aqidah. Haven't you? What's your name, Akhi? Hassan. It's a good name. Haven't you learned the Aqidah? Why are you doing this? You think there's more? There's nothing more, Akhi. There's more? Muhammad. Yeah? I don't think there's more. There's nothing more. Huh? That's why I said we have finished the class, we finished the course. Simply that is the Aqidah. Follow the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. That is simple. But the scholars, they made things easy for us. Because now if you enter the class today, you have to go and read the whole Quran and take all the ayahs which deal with beliefs and take that as your Aqidah. How long is that going to take you? <laughs> forever? You won't live forever, Akhi. And you have to go and read all the books of Hadith. How long is that going to take you? It take you forever. You don't have forever. Don't say forever. Forever is not an option. How many as you think you have? Uh, how many as you think you have left in life? Let me put guys on the spot now. How many? How many as you think you have left? You don't know. I don't know. So, but I'm asking you. Mashallah. That's good. That's good. I enjoy your company, so another 50 years will be good. <coughs> How many years do you think you have, Muhammad? <laughs> yeah, but if you just estimate. Huh? On the old ones, so because they have seen things. How long do you think you have to live, Akhi? The old ones. How, m how much you have to live, you think? No, older ones, I say. Not old ones, older ones. 30 more? 50? 60? 20 more? Armin, how many more? Akhi? Not you. How old are you? I'm, the old ones, the younger ones, I ask, how old are you? The old ones, you ask how much more you have. Uh. <laughs> what is left? That's how it is. Right? The good thing is we just have to make use of your time. No matter how much is gone or how much is coming. But the point is, you'll have to read the whole Quran and read the whole Sunnah to learn the correct Aqidah. The Imams of Islam, they did things, they made things easy for us. They took everything and wrote these books. And so we, have, we always say we have to appreciate all the scholars of Islam. They made things, life easy for us. They made life very easy for us. Imagine, the brother came with a question here. There's someone who's sick in the hospital and she cannot do wudu. Imagine I was not here or there was nobody else who was knowledgeable who he can access. He would have to go and read the whole Quran and find those ayahs which say that. If there's no water or you're sick, what do you do? And read the whole sunnah. But Allah, he was merciful to us. He brought scholars who spread the knowledge. Let's take a small break and then come back, inshallah. That is the last talk. We finished? Do you have any questions? We are finished for today.
As you see, this one hour, it goes really, really fast. That's why one day is not enough for a week. No. You're young, that's why. I like that, but unfortunately, no. The bro sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. The brother asked, how long is this course going to go on? Usually we do it for three months. So by September 17th, we start. And by December 17th, it will be finished. Inshallah. It's not a long time, three months. As those who have been here before. It's September 17th today, right? It's 18th. Yes, yes, ah, yes. That is not for now. That is not for now. The Ibadiyya in Oman, you're asking, who are they? They are a group or a sect who are not on the correct aqidah. Simply speaking. How are they not on the correct aqidah? I will explain to you later on. See, one thing you have to know. I know most of you have questions. Okay, what about this group? What about that group? What about this group? Don't worry about the groups now. You have to learn what is correct. Once you know what is correct, anyone, like these imams taught us today, Anyone who says anything which is according or corresponding to that, then you say what? That is right. Anyone who contradicts that, it is wrong. Learn what is right, then you know where you're going. Yes? If there's only one Akida, why are we studying? No, we are saying this is the Akida of Abu Hanifa, and this is the Akida of Malik, and this is the Akida of Shafi, and this is the Akida of Ahmad. It is all one. That's what we're trying to prove here. We're not doing four Akidas, it's one. That's why you see all these statements were one. Yes. Do they have? They have blind followers? What? I, I cannot hear you. Did they have blind followers during their time? No. During their time, there was no blind followers. Because their speech was clear. Their speech was clear. But people who came after them, came up with this blind following thing. During their time, was, if this is what he's saying to Yaqub, Imam Abu Hanifa, says, Wayhak Yaqub, don't write everything you hear from me. And you'll find actually Imam Yaqub and Imam Muhammad bin Hassan, they contradict or go against Imam Abu Hanifa in one third of the madhab. A third of the Hanafi madhab. They have different opinions. The two main students of Abu Hanifa. This shows that they had no blind following. Naam. No, not really. This is, he feared he feared blind following, but there was no blind following. And the proof is that, that during their lifetime, Yaqub and Muhammad Hassan, they contradicted Abu Hanifa during their lifetimes. Yeah, but then he used to talk about it, right? After that, he used to talk about it. He would correct blind following, exactly. But the blind following he is asking is the blind following we have like today. We have people shut their ears like they don't want anything to hear about anything which contradicts their madhab. That never existed. During their times, it never existed. Yes? The brothers asking, we had different uh, other imams. 
Guys, you see what I'm doing? I am making my binder clean and nice and putting my thing inside the, the binder. I hope you do the same. Okay, it doesn't fit. Why? Where did all these other madhahib go? That's the question. Where did the madhahib of Thawri go? The madhahib of al go? They died out. You know, they didn't have so many students who took the madhahib after them, and then they taught it after them, and then they taught it. Unlike the, the, these three, these four madhahib. And also these four madhahib, they had support from the governments of that time. Like the people of Kufa, the leader would say, okay, we will follow officially the Hanafi madhab. So the judges, the Quda in the courts, Islamic courts would rule by this madhab. The people of North Africa would say, we follow the Maliki madhab. That's how they grew. Briefly, and that's how they grew. But some of the other opinions of these other Imams, they do exist. They do exist. We have opinions of the Sahaba. We have the photos of Umar which are preserved, the photos of Ibn Abbas which are preserved. But those ones are few. That is the reason. Allah A'lam. Did you hear me clicking my binder? Okay. By the way, if you leave your binder behind, we repossess it and it doesn't come back to you. You know that rule, right? We repossessed around 10 books last Friday from the Arba'in Nawawiya. Those who left them behind, you're never getting it again. Huh? Can you, ha you didn't get one? Okay, you'll get one. Yes. I said I was going to teach you about the Shia. Is that ever going to happen? Yes, it is going to happen. When? I don't know. We were planning, the Sheikh was coming, Sheikh Uthman Khamis, he was coming for the conference. He is the expert in today's world about the Shia. In fact, if you mention his name to a Shia, a Shia who has knowledge, the Shia will literally pee on himself. I'm saying this very, very often, seriously. He is that good, mashallah. He has debated, he has debated them so long and he has written so many books. I was hoping the Sheikh would come and he was going to do that. But since maybe he'll be coming December. So you ask me the same question, December, if he does not come. But I will teach about the Shia. Now we have started to teach about Aqidah. We are not stopping, inshallah. This is the beginning. Yes. You had a question? No? Anyone else had a question before we finish? Okay. Tomorrow is what time? 7 o'clock. Muslim time or Kenyan, Ethiopian, Syrian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Somali time. Muslim time. <laughs> inshallah. Most of you when you say inshallah, you scare me. Because your inshallah is inshallah. Okay, last question. Naam Sheikh. Like how? Yes. About the same hadith? Yeah, yeah, well, not, I cannot think of any examples right now. Do you know their opinions? Okay then. You have to, he's asking about the Imam's opinions. I cannot think of any right now. I will go and check, inshallah. Naam? Yeah, not that I know of. Not that I know of. Mostly, though, they would have difference of opinion because a hadith has not reached him at all. You know, this hadith never reached him. 
That's why there will be difference. But that a hadith has reached him, and they defund this on that one hadith. Sometimes that could happen, because one would say, okay, this hadith is general, and there's another hadith which makes it has a specific ruling. That could happen. But just one hadith which stands, on, and we also have to know something: the issues they agreed on, even in the madhab in the fiqh, are ninety percent. The issues they differed in is the 10%. There's no difference that you have to pray five times a day. You have to make wudu before praying. There's no difference in that. Things which are clear, there's no difference in that. I know this madhab issue is always, you have questions on it. So ask, today is your day. Because tomorrow we're starting the actual book. You have five more minutes. Naam. Why do people now still differ, even though the, all the hadith are available to them? People just choose to stick to the madhab. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those scholars, they just choose to stick to that madhab. He doesn't want to change. He believes that this is the only way. It's strange, I know, me and you, we think, how can that be? Someone you know, this is what the Prophet said, but it contradicts. He says, some of the things they have, the misconceptions they have, they say, how could Imam Abu Hanifa not know this? How could Shafi'i not know this? That is one of the things they say. Of course. Or they would say, maybe he knew it, but he's fatwa because there's another, there's another proof. We still follow him. Things like those. It's a question which is very difficult. It's very difficult to answer. Why would someone still choose to follow the opinion which is contradictory to an authentic hadith. I don't have the answer, to be honest. I don't have the answer. It's not, you cannot understand it. Some of them choose that because that's how they get followers. They don't want to lose the fan base, you know. They have so many friends and followers. They don't want to lose them. No? They're not called scholars. Ibn Abdul Bar, he says, anyone who opposes the way of the Prophet ﷺ and follows his madhab while knowing this is contradictory to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, all the scholars agreed that this person is not to be called a scholar. He's not called a scholar. لا يسمى عالم. But it's difficult to... Why? Allah, Allah a'lam. That's why he gets paid. That's why he becomes rich. Why would he leave that? So many factors. Or maybe he just doesn't know. Yes? You had a question? Yeah. Does it have to be with the pinky finger to clean the toe? Yes, that's how the Prophet did it. You do the same thing. You clean between your toes. And also your fingers, by the way, when you're doing wudu, you have to clean between your fingers. This is very important. Hygiene-wise. That's how the doctors will go into surgery. That's how they clean their hands. Have you seen how they clean their hands? They have to clean in between. It's very important. The Prophet ﷺ taught us this those years when he was alive. You have to clean between your fingers and between your toes. Especially your toes. Naam? Sorry? If water does not touch these parts, your wudu is not valid. Just do it, Akhi. The Prophet ﷺ did it, just do it. If you forget, if you forgot, you forgot. But did water touch that part or not? If the water never touched that part, take that question. Then there's no wudu. Right? Yes, quickly. You had a question, Muhammad? It's the same question. Okay, yes. Okay.
How? No, not really. The madhahib. No. The madhahib, the way they began again, is the opinions where there was issues where they didn't have the enough knowledge or why they differed. There's reasons for that. But it's not four different interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah. That is it's what has come to be. That's what it has come to be. But it should not be like that. Because it was never like that. Some things are very clear. That's why I said 90% all of us we agree on. 10% is issues, yes, there has to be interpretations where people, they differ on that. Yeah, if it's on the 10%, yes. But now, okay, the question comes, can they be something where there has to be differing? Like there's no solution, there's no one answer. People cannot come to an answer. The answer is no. The answer is no. Because Allah would not bring a sharia where there's ambiguity to it. You know? So yes, there could be interpretation here, interpretation here. And that scholar, Allah may reward him for his interpretation, his opinion. At the end of the day, though, you are supposed to follow what is right. So this interpretation is wrong. You say, may Allah forgive him. He was wrong. This interpretation was right. You say, I follow this. You choose the person you trust most. The person you see who is really trying to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. The person who does not know what is right or is wrong. Your duty is in one thing. Choosing the right person to ask your questions. Right? Okay. A sister was praying in Niqab. No? I don't know what this word is. N I G A M. Niqab. Covering the face. While you are praying, should you wear the niqab? No. When praying, the Muslim woman should not cover her face. While praying, you should not wear the niqab while praying or the gloves. Unless you are somewhere outside where man can see you, then you can wear the niqab. But somewhere nobody can see you, only sisters are in your house. You don't wear the niqab while praying. You don't wear the niqab while praying. When you are making dua for Syria now, from the men's side, they said, Amin, Amin, is it sunnah? If not, why the imam, does not str why the imam doesn't strongly say not to do? It is okay. General dua. General dua, it is okay to say amin. That is fine. It's completely fine. Okay, we have to stop here. We'll continue tomorrow, inshallah, 7 a.m. Subhan 7 p.m. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shadallah ilanta astaghfiruka tubalaykum.